It's a great pleasure to to welcome Katrina McCallum from from PLOS. And I was just saying that um, I met 12 years ago when PLOS started a colleague of her, Barbara Cohen, and she was coming from nature to PLOS to launch, help launching this um, fantastic uh, initiative. And uh, Barbara was coming from nature, you were coming from Elsevier, so they really had a very clever approach to start an endeavor to build a, a new publishing model. And I think now, 12 years later, we can really say that they have achieved their goals, probably much more than achieve um, what, what could have been expected. PLOS is really a landmark in publishing and more and more it's also becoming a major player in developing open science. And so I'm very happy that Katrina is here. Please, the floor is yours. Well, I'd just like, first like to thank Christina and the organizing um, committee uh, for inviting me here. And um, PLOS got a lot of foundation money um, at the start from the Moore Foundation. But um, in truth, if it, hadn't, it, if it wasn't for the library community, and the support that the library community gave to PLOS, I don't think we would be um, in the same position today. So just very briefly to tell you about PLOS, um, we've been a publisher since 2003. Um, we have seven journals, and PLOS Biology uh, was the first one, launched in 2003, and uh, PLOS One in 2006. PLOS One is our largest journal. Um, and if you look at the numbers, um, we've published uh, more than 135,000 articles, about 33,000 in 2014. They receive about um, 11.6 million article downloads um, per month, um, uh, 1.9 million downloads, um, 11.6 um, article views. We have um, almost 7,000 editors and more than 90,000 reviewers helping to uh, run the process. Um, and we're enormously grateful for the time and resources they put in um, to, to help us with the, with the peer review. And all the journals are peer reviewed. And just to throw in what is open access, um, there's lots of different definitions, but at least for PLOS, it means free access, um, no embargoes, and very liberal reuse. And we apply the Creative Commons attribution license um, to our articles. So what I want to talk about uh, a bit today is, is what is publishing. And here is a, a typical graphic. This is from JISC about the research life cycle of which uh, publishing and publication is, is one part. And this is a quote from the STM uh, report this year, which says, journals form a core part of the process of scholarly communication and are an integral part of the scientific uh, research itself. Journals do not just disseminate information, they also provide a mechanism for the registration of the author's president, maintain quality through peer review, and provide a fixed archival version for future reference. And uh, what I want to argue today is that I think the journal is failing in all those areas. Um, but there's no doubt the journal is a huge success. Again, from the same report, there's more than 28,000 peer-reviewed journals uh, which publish uh, approximately 2.5 million articles a year. And um, um, there are many uh, very successful publishers, um, somewhere between 500 and 10,000. Those are huge confidence limits. Um, seven to nine million researchers. And most publishers make their content available online. Um, and this is from an article that's been published within the last two weeks in PLOS One about the oligopoly of the academic publishers. Um, and in the 19th century, journals became the fastest and most convenient way of disseminating um, results. And most were initially published by scientific societies, and they were held uh, within the academy. Um, and while the digital revolution has really revolutionized communication, the journals essentially remain the same, um, and the PDF is, is actually the dominant mode of distribution. But the authors um, did an analysis of publisher share of papers taken from uh, uh, the Web of Science between um, 1973 and 2013, and they looked um, at mergers and acquisitions as well. 
And the proportion held by the top five publishers um, in the natural and medical sciences and in the social sciences and the humanities has increased um, uh, since 1973 from between 10 and 20% to more than 50%. And we recognize um, all those publishers in there as, as very dominant players. And it includes actually um, a well-known um, society. Interestingly, for biomedical papers, so a subset, of, a subset of the STEM subjects, that share has recently declined, and the authors attribute it to um, the new open access journals, um, such as PLOS One. Um, while in physics, um, it's a different picture again, um, and it may be that, uh, again, the authors, the, the authors stated that the, the field may be less profitable for commercial publishers, so they haven't gained quite the traction here that they have in other subjects. Um, and this is perhaps due to the importance of societies, um, the uh, presence of archive, and um, innovative deals like SCOAP 3, where they converted uh, the journals to open access. Um, this is a graph, and I apologize for anyone who's, who's colorblind, but essentially, um, the, if you combine the red and the blue together across the two, two uh, uh, STEM and the uh, humanities and social sciences, then um, you can see that the shift has been from uh, small to big publishers since the late 1990s. Um, and the journal market is enormously successful. Uh, we know that it's about uh, uh, worth about 10 billion in, in 2013. That's the English language publishing business, but the broader STM uh, publishing market is worth about 25 billion. And um, at a meeting last year with the Open Access uh, Scholarly Publishers Association, Association, a business analyst called Claudio Aspesi um, provided this analysis of the stocks and shares of, of two of the dominant publishers, um, Elsevier and, and Wiley. And basically, they're doing fantastically well. And this is over the same period that um, open access has been um, introduced uh, and is growing. And, and we like to think we're successful, um, but it's not clear that we're being that successful. And on top of that, the um, APC uh, model seems to be an additional revenue stream over and above a very successful subscription business for the publishers. And this led um, Claudio Espezi, and th this, these are, these, this is essentially a slide that he presented, to say that open access um, is failing. Um, and he said, and, and Danny Kingsley actually brought this up very nicely yesterday, that there is no thing as the open access movement, um, there is no common goal, and the definition remains vague. Um, uh, Claudio also uh, uh, stated the fact that there's multiple different policies, and he presented that as Europeans are from Mars and Americans are from Venus, but I'm, uh, I'll leave it there. Um, and again, the hybrid model is effectively um, impossible to, to monitor. And then the expectations that open access would actually address the serial cost crisis um, are fading away. Um, now, I, I, I don't think he's necessarily true, um, and I think actually um, the talk that Jean-Claude Bergamon gave um, at, on the first day of this conference about open science does provide us with a much more coherent agenda about where we're trying to go than just open access. Um, and I'll return to that later. But on top of that, we now have a huge uh, administrative cost of trying to comply with different open access policies. And Stephen Pinfield very kindly gave me advance notice of his and his colleagues' uh, paper, which is going to be published in the next couple of weeks, and the citations um, down there at the bottom, about the, administ the actual administrative costs of the RCUK policy um, to um, um, mandate open access. And for... Uh, the institutions, on average, it took them more than two hours to process uh, an APC payment and work out what the license was and, and manage the invoicing um, at a cost of about uh, $133 per article. And there were few, if any, economies of scale because everything was individually handled. Um, and uh, Stephen actually uh, uh, couches this in terms of, of gold, gold versus green, but I'm, I am actually trying to get away from those terms because gold, gold is more than a business model. Um, but but uh, you can interpret it that way um, if that's easier. And so, but deposition in a repository takes less time at about 45 minutes per paper um, and at a cost of, of $50 per article. And there are some economies of scale and they conclude that this is probably because most institutions have been running repositories for longer and they know um, how it works. But essentially managing APCs is currently about two and a half times the cost 
of institutional deposition, and there, there is massive variation. Um, one poor person took over a day to, to handle one APC. Um, and this means that in terms of compliance, the total cost um, of the RCUK policy just to administer is about $14 million, and that excludes the cost of APCs. If you include the cost, um, that goes up to $11 million. Um, it takes vast amounts of staff time. It doesn't include all the advocacy and training costs uh, are not included. And they, they stated that the significant factor was the requirement to liaise uh, with hybrid publishers, and that born um, OA publishers like PLOS were generally uh, identified as being much quicker and easier to deal with. Um, and also that this transitional period will last for, se for several years. So we are in a state of flux, and it's a very expensive state of flux while we get uh, our workflows and processes in place. But I want to uh, return to what is publishing and the central uh, position of the journals um, in this, in this uh, cycle. So we know it's no longer about journals or books, but it's about uh, uh, numerous different uh, multimedia platforms providing content um, in different ways. It's about um, archives for the uh, STEM subjects as well, um, bioarchive. It's about uh, university presses, and th these are coming from the library community, and this is uh, UCL's Open Access Press, um, um, which uh, Paul had a huge hand in. Um, but it's also about centralized repositories such as Open Air. And it's about the conversation around the articles in the journal. Um, and I think the one thing we can conclude, and we should perhaps stop saying it's a research life cycle, because it's not a life cycle, it's a network. And the increasing interconnection of networks themselves is an important phenomenon. And I don't think I'm actually, anything in this talk I'm, I'm telling you is something you don't know about. I've been to numerous talks over the past few days and, and everything I'm saying, I think the library community knows about and is doing in, in more depth. So uh, bear with me and maybe perhaps treat this as a summary uh, of some of the themes of the conference. Um, but the point is, is that the increased connectivity of networks itself lead to changes, and, and this is where we have both opportunities and challenges. And the implications of increased connectivity is that we can pool resources such as data, tools, materials, infrastructure, and people. We have opportunities for increased global collaboration um, in terms of new areas of, of research and questions that could not previously be addressed, and the opportunity for local engagement um, beyond the traditional uh, research community. And citizen science is one area, but there are others and the potential to enhance the application of research to local um, um, problems, um, economic and otherwise. So how do we facilitate this network? Um, and basically we have to do two things. We have to ensure scholarship can be reused and ensure scholarship um, is reused. And this could be done um, um, through different types of application, and we can look at how those outputs are being used with a variety of different metrics um, now. Um, all of that reuse represents um, impact of the outputs of institutions and libraries and scholarship in general. And the fundamental premise is that we have to ensure scholarship is reusable. So how do we do this? We need to build scale. We need interoperable platforms and infrastructure. We need to remove access barriers and reuse barriers, both technical and cultural. And we need to maximize the network effects by incentivizing players across a whole range of different stakeholders. And ultimately, it's hugely important that we monitor the progress of what we're doing and whether we're trying, whether we're actually on the right direction to achieve this goal of open science. Um, and to do that, we need to make the data about the system publicly available um, for independent scholars, not publishers, to be able to scrutinize. So publishing is not just about content provision. In fact, putting something up on the web is probably the least interesting thing um, you can do. Um, it's about connections between people, organization, objects, facts, ideas, and events, such as submission and publication. And it's about relationships and discovery and reliability. So it's about services. Um, and I think, again, this is something you all know about, and there's been a fantastic array of different um, services on show, both in, in, in the talks and in the posters. Um, but the idea for open science is about servicing uh, the scholarly communications network, and um, that's what I think publishers should be doing. 
Um, and I'm going to rattle through some of the services. I know you know about these in, in, in a lot of detail, but we need information that is uh, machine readable. And I wanted to, uh, and the common uh, standards for data and meta metadata that allow objects to link um, with each other automatically rather than um, uh, um, through manual searches. Um, and, our, um, and in this uh, instance, ORCID, I think, is absolutely fundamental um, to the system. And I know you've heard um, a bit about that today, and there's a great poster out there from Imperial showing what they're doing. But we need to be able to track the outputs of different people um, reliably, and not just researchers, but others who might be contributing to that network. Um, we also need DOIs around those, these objects. And this is a graph uh, from JISC showing the increase in the content of UK institutional repositories. And again, I'm sorry for the color blind in the audience, but I want you to look at the green bars, because the green bars are the proportion of that content that actually have a DOI associated with them. So there's a massive amount lacking a DOI in, in institutional repositories. And there's absolutely no need that uh, um, any of that content shouldn't have a DOI, whether it's theses, gray literature, uh, videos, um, um, uh, preprints, um, whatever. And if you have a DOI, there are now new services emerging um, to, to help you look at the impact around that. And I just want to um, flag here the DOI event tracker. This is an initiative and it's still at the proof of principle stage from Crossref which is uh, to provide a way to track the activity. Um, it might be metrics, it might be mentions in uh, Wikipedia and that sort of thing. Um, and Crossref acts as a hub for that data. They're not trying to analyze the information or provide a score like alt metrics. Um, and importantly, the data are going to be made openly available from Crossref um, so that others can, can independently analyze it. And it relies on open source software that uh, PLOS developed, and I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Martin Fenner here who wrote the software, um, to retrieve data on article level metrics. And this is a collaboration among um, publishers and funders and universities at the moment, including PLOS and, and Elsevier. And there are other services. Um, I had some great talks um, uh, uh, on the first day, and I just wanted to flag um, two of them about text and data mining. And I know that Lieber has shown a huge leadership in this area, um, and the Hague Declaration is a fantastic initiative, and, and PLOS is a signatory. Um, but um, the, I can't read her name, Pina Ozdruk, and I apologize for mangling her name, uh, provided um, an analysis of text mining um, for the Ocean Certain EU project, which is to deal with uh, climate change, and they're, dealing, uh, they're trying to come up with um, uh, hypothesis generation. And their output is our, our articles in a machine-readable format that can be mined. And they did this with 10,000 full papers from Nature, but they can't actually share the results. Um, and so they're going to try and do it with the, with the um, uh, PLOS corpus, but of course that's not enough. And we need to uh, lift the copyright restrictions on the text in order to help build this network. And uh, Lucy Gabo, who is also in the audience, provided a survey showing um, that in EU member states there's relatively strong, comparatively strong copyright restrictions. And researchers are actually lagging behind um, in this area, which I think is going to put the EU at a disadvantage. Um, and I just wanted to also give a shout out to the Content Mine, uh, which is founded by uh, Peter Murray Russ with Shuttleworth. Uh, so there are initiatives trying to break down these barriers. Um, another major service that Mark Wolpert um, um, talked about in his talk on the first day was uh, about around peer review. Um, and the problem with peer review is, and um, people say peer review is broken, but we actually don't know because it's behind a black box, and so we can't actually analyze independently of its effectiveness. And we certainly see um, problems arising from peer review. Um, I've been an editor, um, a professional editor, for, for many, many years and seen, uh, handled thousands of papers. And I, I have seen a fantastic peer review and, and appalling peer review. Um, but um, Peer review is not necessarily designed for the network. Uh, research is a global enterprise, and it's not clear that peer review can scale. And moreover, authoring and reviewing tools don't promote collaboration and sharing. Um, authors and reviewers, um, they submit and they review for journals and for journal criteria. And journals have restrictions on page lengths, and they limit the amount of the material that can be contained within them. Um, and reviewers are about rejecting articles based on journal criteria rather than 
necessarily the soundness of science and whether any other one might actually have some use for some of that material in the papers. Um, and of course, there's huge problems with data. This is an, uh, this is an, uh, uh, an article from Tim, Tim Vines. And what he has shown is that with every year that an article increases in age, uh, you are, there is a uh, probability that the data being available with that paper will drop by about 17%. Um, percent. And PLOS has a data policy to try uh, and address that. And then we also have a huge problem about uh, re reliability, and uh, you will recognize many of these things um, from uh, reports in, in the press and the media where they're, and from retraction walks where they're highlighted. Um, and there are solutions to these, um, and uh, Mark Wolpert talked about some of them, uh, and part of it is about improving the information in journal articles. Um, all that boring information about the materials and the methods and the design needs to go back in the paper. Um, often it is ditched from papers or relegated to the supplementary information, and this makes papers actually less reliable. Um, we also need to open up the peer review process and how things are evaluated, and we need much more continuous peer review, um, um, so both pre-publication and post-publication, and all of that needs to be open, and, and PLOS is exploring ways to do that at the moment. Um, so ultimately, open science is, is really about being open. It's about transparency. We also need transparencies around the business models and the uh, APC model. And here I, I know there are initiatives by JISC and SURF uh, um, and others. I just want to flag one by the Max Planck Digital Library about efficiency and standards for article charges. Um, and their aim is to keep transaction costs for open access article charges um, at a minimum and to support and contribute the development of a transparent and efficient APC market. Now, I know uh, Martin Eve said yesterday um, that there can be no uh, market for scholarly uh, um, outputs, um, but I do think we can have a, a market around services and we need to keep them transparent. And ultimately, uh, we have to make that information available. Institutions and libraries should, pub uh, should make public what they are paying to publishers, including PLOS and others, um, so that others can compare. And I think signing non-disclosure agreements I is not a service. But we need to be a bit intelligent about um, um, openness. Um, I think it can improve on the reliability um, of research. Um, and it will help um, independent experts to analyze the system and the services within that system to see how they're effective. But it needs to be um, balanced against the uh, need for the privacy of thought of researchers um, to give them the space to analyze their data. And it needs to take account of confidentiality. Um, and also, we need to think about services in terms of new stakeholders. Now, citizen science is, is one very obvious one, and the um, Biodiversity Heritage Library gave a talk this morning um, um, about some of the work that, that they're doing in that as, as well, and that's a, that's a great initiative. There's also Galaxy Zoo. But we need to think even wider, patients and nurses, um, public-private partnerships, and again, this is where text and data mining becomes so essential, and of course, the general public who are interested. Um, and um, on top of this, we've got to provide the right sort of incentives. And Martin Eve talked yesterday about the symbolic capital of journals, and we know that prestige dominates, and decisions um, made about hiring and firing are not transparent. And we know that researchers and institutions are risk averse. And um, at the root of all of this, and in fact, this was the conclusion of Claudio Espezi um, in his uh, original analysis, is that researchers and institutions are unable to wean themselves off the impact factor. And I think, you know, often it's the libraries that are blamed uh, for not cancelling subscriptions. But as long as academics um, put pressure on them uh, to maintain those subscriptions, as long as institutional leaders insist on using the impact factor as a surrogate measure of quality, um, it's going to continue to, uh, um, the, the subscription journal business will persist as it is, and the system is essentially stuck. Um, and um, Claudio uh, Espezi uh, actually concluded that the impact factor, um, the journal impact factor, is propping up the subscription model. And I think he's probably right. So we need to think about qualities and not quality. And we think, uh, 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 and article level metrics come into that, and these need to be open, and PLOS has developed its own suite of article level metrics. Um, 
But uh, we need to make sure, again, and uh, I'm re reiterating this, that it is the community that has the ability to analyze what they mean. And we need to combine quantitative metrics with qualitative assessment. And I believe Hefke is about to come out with a report about this um, in the first two weeks of July that will be worth looking at. And of course, it's uh, uh, not just individual incentives, but we need uh, network incentives to um, help facilitate the network. And we need mechanisms and frameworks that drive directional change at the system rather than highly targeted interventions with specific goals. And we need policy interventions focused on the creation of the, fr of the appropriate frameworks and mechanisms. And this includes uh, actual rewards for network behavior and for sharing. There is no incentive for any author um, to share at the moment. Um, and I wanted to put a spin on the sort of uh, citizen science. Um, we need to take, sci uh, scientists, I think, need to take responsibility to be an open citizen um, as well and to change the culture within the academy to try and enable um, um, that open culture. Um, and as I've said, we need a, a system of hiring and firing that moves away um, from the impact factor, and we need to include um, um, different stakeholders. And, and Stephen had a great quote yesterday um, that we needed a, a more, and he was talking in terms of, of policy frameworks uh, and how to make open policies and drive cultural change to uh, uh, make a more open culture. Um, let's have a more holistic approach to open, which I think is fantastic. Um, just to flag, though, in terms of rewarding open behavior, Google Plus, Welcome, um, and other sponsors actually funded a prize um, about the best use of open access um, um, articles and literature. I'm not going to say anything about it, but it's available. information is available on the website if you wanted to look. Um, and finally, we need to talk about the community governance. And um, I don't have time to go into this. Um, just now, and I think it's a huge topic in itself, and I've listed some of the properties here, and this has come from an article by Jeff Builder of Crossref, Jennifer Lynn um, at PLOS, and, and Cameron Nalen, who was at PLOS and is now an independent researcher, about how um, a community-governed infrastructure could work. And this is something that I think the libraries can take a huge role in helping um, to lead this infrastructure, because you are the people with the expertise um, to know um, how to manage it. So I want to come back to what I originally started with, um, and this is a bit of a mouthful, is the journal The Sustainable Networkable Service. Um, and um, I don't think it is, um, um, regardless actually of whether it's open access or subscription-based. I think the symbolic capital that uh, M Martin Eve um, talked about yesterday is so tied up with the existing journal management. And Mark Walput also um, talked about the fact that we need different versions of articles and um, we need to manage that process. Um, and the journal at the moment is not uh, equipped to, to do that. Um, and if you think about scientific knowledge as a global public good, as Dr. Manon Rees said yesterday, um, then I think there is a real question mark about the role of the journal as we see it in the scholarly network. I think if journals are a means to aggregate the community around specific subject areas, then that's fan fantastic. Um, but at the moment, I think they are hampering um, open science, um, and we need to address this. Um, one possible solution, this is my last slide, uh, which I'm going to leave on, uh, and there has been a lot of discussion about whether we need uh, just to have a wholesale conversion of subscription journals to open access, and, and certainly I think making everything open access and available with a CC BY license uh, would be a huge um, step forward. But I think we have to uh, be very cautious about how this is done because what we don't want is to replace an oligopoly of uh, subscription uh, publishers with one business model with the same oligopoly uh, with an APC model. Um, and um, in order, uh, and especially if the symbolic capital of journals is retained, they're going to be able to command much, much higher prices in terms of APC than that service is actually worth, worth purely brace, uh, uh, based on brand value. So I think that there are, are big questions about how we manage this shift. I would love to see a wholesale conversion managed properly uh, and uh, that drove the cost of, of APCs down. And it might mean that this has to actually, um, we'll need someone from the industry um, who knows the industry to step forward and actually uh, 
help to manage that process, and we will need the collaboration um, of funders and institutions at both a national and international le level in order to manage that process. And I think, you know, eventually then we will have a sustainable network of open science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for this very, very exciting talk. Um, are there questions in the room? Okay, while well, you think I have one question. Oh, David. David Pross for Research Libraries UK. Thanks very much. That was um, a, a great uh, um, a tour over the, uh, of the horizon and, um, and the environment. Um, I, I have uh, an issue with the notion of um, waiting, to, um, waiting for cancellations before we transform the scholarly communications um, um, environment. And I, I think that the notion that we should um, hold up the transfer until such time as we are all in this room able to cancel big deals is, is I know that's not what you're advocating, but I think that, that's something that I worry about a lot. Um, the movement forward should not be contingent upon that, in, in, in my view. I think that we need to build up the new systems which are there, will then allow us to start withdrawing from the traditional models. Um, it, it, it's that way round it's going to happen. It, it's not going to happen if we wait until we liberate the whatever it is, the eight, nine billion yeah. dollars a year. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree, actually, and I should have made that point. And actually, that speaks to, to again, the talk we heard yesterday from, from Manon Reis um, about not just fighting the old, but actually spending our energy on building the new. And I think that's what this LIBA conference has, has demonstrated. It's about all the new services and platform, and that has to be done in parallel. But I, I, I do think we need to think head on how we're going to tackle the subscription business um, at the same time. We shouldn't, we shouldn't stop building stuff. I, I completely agree, yeah. Hello, my name is Margot Baguer from um, Göttingen Library. You mentioned that as long as we don't get away from this overload of symbolic capital in the journal, we are not really getting away from the danger of running into next oligopoly. What is your rec recommendation for this weaning off process? So in Germany we have this idea that if children need to get rid of the um, the Schnuller Fee, so the fairy comes and takes it away and puts something else under the pillow of the child. So what would be the small present under the pillow of the researcher when we take away the impact factor? <laughs> I, uh, I agree. I, I mean, I think article level uh, metrics are one way to do that, but there's a time lag um, with that. Um, I, I think you know, uh, more understanding also about what the impact factor is. I, I really think institutional leaders, um, the people who are responsible for hiring and firing, are using it uh, as an incredibly blunt tool. And we know that um, there's more variance actually um, between, uh, within a journal in terms of the citations that contribute to the impact factor than there, than there is between journals. So an impact, a journal, a paper in a, in a journal with an impact factor of 30 is not six times worth one in a journal with an impact factor of five. Um, and so we need to focus on the quality of the output. We need to look at the context in which that article um, is done. So, so it's not always um, academic. Um, quality um, or, you know, in terms of academic advance, we need to look at sort of policy and implications. And I think it's probably got to come from funders um, actually ruling it out of um, any issue. And I think a lot of funders do, but institutional leaders ignore it um, and use it anyway because it's easy. Um, and so I think if there's uh, specific funding that associated uh, with individuals that are actually actively sharing and contributing openly to the network, and um, people see that you can get grants and money by being a good open 
science citizen, then I think that will, that will shift it away. Um, but yeah, ultimately, the academy, in a way, is responsible for propping up the impact factor, and uh, we, need to, we need to break that down either. And if, uh, you know, if I had the solution, we'd have done it. And I, uh, you know, I think it's hard. Uh, hello, uh, Eleni Zuzani from Imperial College. I would like to ask you how you define intelligent openness. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I would like to ask you how you define intelligent openness. Um, well, I, I think it's uh, uh, some of the things that I, I talked about there in terms of just, just not openness for openness sake. Um, we want um, researchers to share um, but we should also acknowledge um, that they do need time to think about their data and have the opportunity to, to analyze it. Um, I also think we have to uh, think about uh, uh, um, the things we can't share because of patient confidentiality um, and, um, or, or other information that, that could potentially be harmful. Um, and I think if, uh, you know, maybe Stephen Pinfield actually can, can talk about this in terms of intelligent openness towards forming an open, an open policy by governments. Um, and um, you'll have to correct me if I'm misinterpreting you, but it's, it, it, it's, it's about perhaps staging the policies. So not having an extreme policy initially, but having actually variation and allowing for variation of policies to uh, enable different cultures and perhaps uh, we heard from Martin Eve yesterday about how the humanities have a different view of this than the sciences. And so we need to be able to incorporate that um, variation as we move the system towards a more open culture. Thank you. Stephen, do you want to re reply? Uh, I think I'm obliged to, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, some work I've been doing with Sheila Coral um, is looking at this idea of taking a more holistic approach to open. And... Um, institutions particularly, but also funders and others, integrating open policies. So they, they don't just include open access as one policy and open data as another and open educational resources as another uh, and a set of different initiatives, but rather they integrate them and think, as I said, holistically about open and about the benefits that you can get across the piece as a result of that. Um, there may be ways in which you can proceed with some more quickly than others, but um, uh, taking a more integrated approach, I think, brings the benefits or has the potential to do so across the board. And we're going to be doing some more research now, and I hope people in this room will contribute to that, looking at where institutions are in this holistic thinking and where they think they could be over the next, next few years. Um, so, you know, that's ongoing research. Can I just say one point about the impact factor as well? This is an anecdotal point, but it really illustrates uh, the, the tension going on here in terms of people's attitudes. On the same day uh, recently, I received a message from a faculty saying, um, please note that the REF does not take account of impact factor in assessing the quality of journal articles, so don't include this in your REF submission. On the very same day, I received another message from faculty, probably from a different person, because it did make reference to it, saying, these are the top 10 impact factor journals in your discipline. Please make every effort to publish in these journals to improve your REF submissibility. That one. QED. All right. Christina. Yes, Christina Hormia from Finland. Actually, first, I, I have a comment and then perhaps a question. Um, my comment relates to the openness of institutions. Um, and in Finland, um, we have a, a government level open science and research initiative, and, uh, which started uh, last year. And it will run until 17. Uh, and as part of that, at the beginning of, of the initiative, uh, the openness of our research organizations has been evaluated. It has been done in two, two phases. First, uh, the web pages have been monitored, so what they say about research management plans, research management policies, uh, open access, uh, sort of how much information can be found openly from open web. 
this was first one, and after that wa was a questionnaire. So now we have a, a picture of, of the openness of research in institutions in Finland, and the surveys will be repeated year after year to see what follows. I think this was quite a nice way to, mm -hmm. to open the, the situation. So this was my comment a bit related to the previous talk. But then, I don't know exactly how to phrase this, but um, several European countries now are negotiating with big publishers, and actually we are re renewing the biggest deal, the most expensive deal at the same time. So Finland, UK, Sweden, and also the Netherlands. So we are now in the process of, of doing this. But in a way, I, I feel a bit teethless because the uh, leaders of research institutions, they are so afraid if they would lose access to the, to the content. So I, I think we, we don't, it's difficult to find the play marks yeah. to, to how, to, how to negotiate, how really to change. I think we have now a big opportunity and we, we, are, we are collaborating and we try to form the strategy if you have some good ideas, they are most welcome, and this is a very critical and good time. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it is a really difficult uh, problem. I, in relation to your first comment, I think ranking institutions on their openness would be would be great. Um, so that you know that that would be a good start, and and and, and scientists, um, scholars. Um, in terms of the second, I think it's just a really difficult problem. It's just a, a massive bind. I, I mean, I think there are now some. Um, innovative offsetting deals, and I know Springer um, has done some, and uh, the Institute of Physics. Um, again, you know, I, I have this worry just about shifting, shifting the the, the business model and maintaining the um, oligopoly. But uh, at the, I also think that it's probably time for funders to look at rewarding uh, publishers for being uh, more open um, and for actually pushing their subscription business towards a more open access business. Um, and I think um, they have the tools uh, to do that and institutions could do that, for example, through not um, funding APCs for hybrid journals that are not shown to be transitioning across a certain uh, period of time. Um, and for um, providing more support perhaps um, in terms of the deals for subscription publishers if they can also simultaneously show that they are actively converting um, journals. Um, and actually, I mean, the, the real thing also, again, I think stems back to this uh, symbolic capital and the impact factors. And one of the things that Claudio Spezi said was that the, um, most people actually only care about the top 10, 20, 30% of journals, um, but the big deals bring along all the other the journals with them, even if they're less well read, um, and I know individual journals are essential to, to you know, to, to different scholars. Um, but um, I think it just all goes back to this root cause of changing that incentive system um, and 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 playing, you know, using sticks and carrots for publishers as well as for for researchers. But I, yeah, I don't have the answer. Thank you. All right, um, maybe. I would like to ask a final question, if I may, and um, it's the achievements of PLOS are really not only in the area of open access publishing and demonstrating that it's possible to build high quality, highly reputated uh, journals, but as you, as you have shown, PLOS has done very, very important work on the um, open science and alternative metrics front and um, you're building APIs and, and allow researchers in the world in scientometrics and bibliometrics really to, to, to play with all your data. So that is very interesting. And could you give us a, a vision how if other publishers or hopefully maybe will join you in, in, in this initiative, how would a world look like in five to ten years um, in scholarly publishing if we would develop all these machine interfaces? Um, well, I think, it, I think it will be completely um, open 
and transparent. I think the role of the journals will be far less, and it will be about um, collaboration and constructive um, criticism around the content, regardless of what that content is, and even the bits of the content. If figure two in uh, a particular paper is interesting, while the rest of it is not very good, then uh, let's promote figure two uh, and make sure it gets to the readers uh, and people who need to use it. Um, and I think it is about uh, the interoperability of the system, and it's why the open source software for, uh, that was developed uh, for article level metrics is actually so fundamental um, so that others can use it and build on it and, and develop the system um, because we don't have all the best ideas at PLOS. Um, and allowing objects to interact um, automatically uh, and discover other objects, um, there's just too much out there and, and, and research is growing. Um, you know, we need to include uh, researchers in China and India um, and South America on these platforms um, and we need to allow data um, to actually be able to discover data itself we cannot expect anymore I think humans to do that search process and, th and that is why actually text and data mining is uh, um, completely fundamental to, to the open science uh, movement I, I hesitate to call it a movement um, and um, um, you know, so I think, I think th that's sort of where the vision is going, probably not articulated very well. I'm sure there's many in the audience um, that could articulate it better. But, uh, Thank you very much.